Okay. Hello, hello. Okay, let's let's start. So, um, what I'm going to talk about is certainly not a detailed introduction to atomic structure theory, or not an attempt at that. At that. But I'll just uh, um, show you a few things that may be important for plasma spectroscopy in general, and I hope we will have time to look at some online. Um, tools, in particular the atomic structure database that we uh, maintain and develop at NIST that is um, the major source of evaluated uh, atomic structure and spectra uh, data. It's, it's uh, the, the, probably the only database in the world that contains truly evaluated atomic, spe atomic spectroscopy data. And also, we will uh, look at um, online interface at developed at Los Alamos that allows you to quickly calculate um, wave functions, energies, oscillator strengths, and so on and so forth. So um, certainly, we, we understand why atomic structure is important. We know that. Uh, whenever we're talking about atomic physics, there is always some kind of matrix element that we have to calculate or analyze. And of course, we have initial state characterized by uh, a set of quantum numbers of various nature. The final state characterized by a different, maybe the same, when function, then operator in between. So whenever we're talking about calculations of wavelengths, energies, transition probabilities, doesn't matter radiative or non-radiative, like organization transition probabilities that um, Stefan Fritsch will be talking about uh, tomorrow, collision cross-sections or anything else that may be relevant, for instance, amplitude, we always are facing these metric elements where, of course, this and this are characteristics of particular atomic states. So uh, let me start with, um, before going into atomic structure, let me mention a few textbooks generally related to atomic processes in plasmas, and some of them are more on atomic structure. So uh, probably plasma spectroscopy as a field of plasma science originated already more than 50 years ago when Hans Grimm published his, his famous uh, textbook on plasma spectroscopy back in 1964. Since then, uh, he published another book, Principles of Plasma Spectroscopy in 1970. But this is when it started, and still this book remains uh, probably one of the most authoritative uh, sources on information and uh, everything related to plasma spectroscopy. Uh, this uh, list is in, in chronological order. So in 81, Bob Cowan published a fundamental, uh, very thick, that extremely detailed and a pleasure to read book that is called Theory Atomic Structure and Spectra. And uh, many of you have heard about Cowan's code. It's very well described in this book. Then uh, there are a few other books with very similar names, Atomic Physics for Hot Plasmas, Atomic Physics in Hot Plasmas, and Atomic Properties in Hot Plasmas, published by different authors. But each of these is uh, also very, very interesting and detailed. In particular, I would like to mention this last book that contains um, many uh, aspects of plasma spectroscopy developed over the recent probably 20 years, maybe 30 years or so, that are not so much touched in any of the other books. Then uh, uh, Fujimoto's plasma spectroscopy textbook contains a lot on uh, collision radiative modeling in particular. Then we saw today in Professor Kuntz's 
talk uh, references to his uh, extremely readable introduction to plasma spectroscopy. Uh, of course, you all are pretty much into plasma spectroscopy, but if you were just novices, this would be the book to start with, absolutely. And uh, last year, a bunch of lectures, lecturers here, Hune, Howard Scott, and myself, we uh, compiled together a few chapters in the book that is called Modern Method and Collision Radiative Modeling of Plasmas, a little bit advanced, but still it gives you uh, uh, up-to-date information of what happens in, in collision radiative modeling. Okay, units. Well, um, one of the mostly used units in atomic spectroscopy and atomic structure is inverse centimeter, uh, which is related to one Rydberg through this uh, 10 to the fifth coefficient, and one EV is about 8,000 inverse centimeters. You will see uh, both of these, mainly EV and uh, inverse centimeter, later on. Of course, the typical unit of length is Bohr radius, which is just radius of hydrogen atom, and accordingly, the typical area is the cross-section, which is pi zero squared, about 10 to the minus 16. And this is the characteristic size of, of, col of uh, collisional cross-sections for, uh, for neutral atoms. Now, a uh, lot of information on units in general you can find at the NIST website. I hope you can see it says physics.nist.gov slash CUU slash units with capital U. But I'd like to mention that uh, there is uh, a com common redefinition of the international system of units that will most likely be approved in uh, uh, next year, 2018. We know that right now the seven fundamental units of SI are based on different, uh, um, some of them are based on, on, on artifacts. For instance, still one kilogram is a little piece of platinum iridium that sits somewhere on the ground in Paris. But the problem with this thing is that its, its mass is not constant. It loses it a little bit, which is natural. So the new international system will be completely redefined in terms of fundamental constants. So right now, we all know that the speed of, line, speed of light is a fixed value, 299792458. Some of the fundamental constants will also be given exact values, and from them, the whole system of units will be uh, uh, derived. Now, uh, this is the latest edition of the uh, periodic table uh, that we published at NIST. It still has uh, old names for the four heaviest elements, and the names were assigned just a couple of months ago, uh, but at least all numericals in the tables are supposed to be good, so please take it and, and uh, use it. Okay, so what kind of atomic structure are we generally interested in in plasma spectroscopy? Uh, simple answer is more or less everything. There are some models that use notion of an average atom characterized by a bunch of electrons uh, sitting together around the nucleus. For instance, if we're looking at 16 electron ion, which would be sulfur-like ion, this is a very picturesque representation of an average atom. But if you want to look at more details, you may go with the super configuration representation, and we'll talk about super configurations as well a little bit, where you simply specify how many electrons sit in different principal, uh, uh, in different shell prin principal quantum numbers. If you're interested in even more detailed representation, you may use uh, configuration. So for instance, this super configuration may consist of a bunch of configuration where you uh, use NL distributions for your electrons. Then certainly you may want to uh, go even uh, the next level uh, represented by atomic terms characterized by total spin and total uh, angular momentum values, which you are certainly familiar with. And uh, of course you may go all the way down to the 
uh, fundamental uh, level, uh, atomic levels uh, uh, representation characterized by J values. Of course, the story doesn't end here if you have uh, electromagnetic fields, uh, well, let's say magnetic, uh, you, you go to components. But uh, uh, the point here is that generally you may be interested in different level of representation for atomic structure. And this tells you, for instance, that there is no universal collision relative model that can be used in all cases. Simply in, well, you can build it in terms of atomic levels, but it may become so huge that no computer in the world can, can uh, work with it. Now, fortunately, Mother Nature gave us hydrogen and hydrogen-like ions. Exactly solvable problem in quantum mechanics, uh, which, with which we can learn so much about atomic structure in general, the scalings, uh, uh, how far electrons sit from nuclear, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, there is no hydrogen atom for plasmas. Each plasma is unique and specific, and if you can solve more or less your problem for one plasma, well, unless you're working with something extremely similar, you can hardly apply this knowledge directly to some other plasma cases. But hydrogen atom certainly gives us a lot uh, regarding atomic structure of all uh, atoms and ions. And of course, we know that moving from hydrogen atom, where uh, the ground state sits at one Rydberg below the ionization potential, the energy, uh, the energy scales as 1 over n uh, squared, the same structure is more or less uh, valid for any hydrogen-like ion that is ion with one electron. Again, in units of uh, energy z squared, Rydberg, the first, uh, uh, the ground state sits at one, this two sit at one fourth, and so on and so forth. We understand how radius of an electron orbit changes with principal quantum number goes like n squared. We understand that uh, the orbits collapse as one over z with increase of, of ion charge. We know how the energy scales, and this uh, information remains very, very important for uh, future analysis of other uh, atoms and ions. Now, we know that in general, atomic states are characterized by number of quantum numbers, but there are only, probably it's fair to say there are only two that are exact. One is total angular momentum, and the other is parity. Of course, you have energy of the state, uh, which is uh, just a number. But as far as discrete numbers are concerned, only two are truly exact. And uh, their conservation, of course, is, uh, uh, comes from uh, the most fundamental properties of uh, our world. Everything else, including total angular momentum, total uh, uh, spin, is really not, not exact. And uh, we will see, of course, the cases when atomic state is a mix of different L's or S's. Um, now, when we're moving from hydrogen atom to complex atoms, uh, generally it's fair to say that we probably know all important interactions that uh, uh, enter our Hamiltonian. And of course, we have a kinetic part, and here I just use uh, atomic units emitting all H bars and so on and so forth, uh, which is just uh, uh, a class in here. Then uh, electrons inter interact with uh, the nucleus with uh, uh, Coulomb potential. Of course, I here enumerates different electrons in the atom. Of course, electrons interact between them again as uh, uh, with the Coulomb law. Then we uh, know that uh, there is spin orbit interaction that basically uh, uh, can be easily described when you move to the uh, reference frame of the electron that sees uh, nucleus uh, uh, charge uh, induced magnetic field due to movement 
of, uh, of uh, the nuclear charge and some other corrections that I will admit that they're not so much important for, for this story. Of course, with this uh, Hamiltonian, we want to solve the Schrodinger equation. And of course, we know that we cannot solve it exactly. Therefore, some approximation uh, must be introduced. And um, the, the mostly used approximation is the so-called central field approximation that basically tries to mimic the effects of uh, Coulomb repulsion among the electrons. So basically, you start with the modified Hamiltonian, uh, of course, uh, keeping the uh, kinetic part, interaction with nucleus, and then uh, we assume that each electron, again, some here goes from uh, over all electrons, moves in a potential independently of all other electrons. Now, the problem, of course, is to probably choose the potential, and here, uh, we can uh, find uh, different methods and techniques, including Hartree-Fock, Thomas Fermi, some types of model potentials. But in any case, almost all uh, realistic approaches to uh, calculation of atomic structure in multi-electron systems start with some kind of central field approximation. Then again, for non-relativistic non case, you uh, find uh, configuration state functions for uh, this Hamiltonian uh, characterized by total L, S, and other quantum numbers. Of course, you must take into account the anti-symmetry of your wave function because we know of the poly exclusion principle that is valid for electrons. So these configuration states are ca characterized by the principal quantum number and uh, orbital angular momentum. And now energy depends on both. For hydrogen, we remember that uh, simply due to uh, uh, accidental degeneracy of Coulomb potential. There's no dependence on L, but here there is. Then we assume that the atomic state function is a linear combination of the configuration state function, and this is the final atomic state function that we want to find. We, we represent it as a sum of all these found configuration functions with uh, some weighting coefficients, and then, of course, the sum goes not all over electrons, but number of uh, uh, the configuration states that we choose uh, as a basis. Then you uh, build Schrodinger equation for this new uh, uh, basis, eventually coming to a solution for the mixing coefficient. And as soon as you find the mixing coefficient and you know the configuration state functions, you know your atomic state function. And, uh, then you can, you can try to do calculation of energies, uh, oscillator strengths, radiative transition probabilities, and so on and so forth. Of course, you must include other effects, primarily through perturbation theory, like uh, uh, spin orbit and others, if you want really good accuracy. But this is the standard procedure that uh, is followed in, in many, many uh, codes. When you move from non-relativistic theory to relativistic theory, especially, uh, if you're dealing with heavy ions, and actually f for not too heavy because relativistic approach certainly is much more general than non-relativistic, which should follow from, from this naturally. Here, uh, the Hamiltonian, of course, looks slightly different because you start not uh, from Schrodinger equation, but from Dirac equation, and therefore you have all these terms that are built with the uh, standard Dirac matrices. Uh, in uh, calculations for relativistic atomic theory, it is generally important to include nuclear charge not as a point charge, but as some uh, extended distribution. And therefore, you have this uh, potential. And of course, uh, uh, you have the Coulomb interaction 1 over R again. Of course, in, uh, uh, in higher orders, you must include corrections to the Coulomb potential. And this was done by Bright. And therefore, this particular additional term that is then added to Dirac Coulomb Hamiltonian is uh, normally called generalized Bright, which includes magnetic interaction and retardation effects. Then, uh, again, if, especially if you are if you're working with really heavy uh, elements, uh, it's good to add 
quantum electrodynamic effects, like uh, uh, self-energy, vacuum polarization, which are standard things that are taught in uh, QED classes. And then you combine all this together, and this is new Hamiltonian that you uh, want to work with. And uh, there are codes I'll mention in a minute that basically do all relativistic atomic structure very well. And Stefan Fritsche will be tomorrow talking about grasp and rate it that use relativistic approach to analysis of atomic structure. Now, um, because relativistic notations are used uh, not so frequently generally in the literature as, as non-relativistic LS uh, uh, notations, I just want to mention that generally uh, in this notation you use J value, of course, because uh, S and L couple together to J. And normally, the J value comes on the right lower side of the L. So if you have S electron, it's the only J value, of course, is 1 half. You add 0 and spin 1 half, you get 1 half. Then for P, you have two options, 1 half, 3 halves. And very often, you use P minus P plus to designate them, and so on for other uh, electrons, D, F, G, and so on and so forth. So which uh, method and codes are available and which are um, used nowadays? There's an old approximation developed by Bates and Damgaard in uh, the late 40s. Basically, you uh, uh, try to, again, mimic your Coulomb interaction, introducing effective principal quantum numbers. Probably nobody uses it today, but still some codes are available. And in, in uh, simple cases, this, this, is, uh, uh, this, this approximation should work. There are some codes based on Thomas Fermi statistical approach. And uh, uh, there's superstructure and then autostructure, which is development of superstructure that have uh, Thomas Fermi option uh, as an uh, option to calculate this central field potential uh, used at the first step. Then you can certainly use different kinds of Hartree-Fock methods. Uh, single configuration, uh, uh, which is used in Cowan's code, but then uh, Cowan's code doesn't stop with this. It uses configuration interaction that we'll talk uh, about a little bit later. And uh, Cowan's code has a line interface that I'll show you in the second, uh, in the second lecture. Uh, there are a uh, few codes that use model potentials that uh, uh, basically, based on some knowledge and of, of how, uh, what, what the potential of atom is, there were uh, some recommendations were developed to use some artificial potentials to describe what electrons in different ions produce as a central, central field. And most uh, widely used codes uh, for relativistic model potentials are Hulock. And a flexible atomic code, uh, Evgeny Stambulchik will be given a uh, uh, lecture on, on FAC uh, implementation. Then um, there are a few codes that use a multi configuration approach. You remember uh, here, oops, we talk about this expansion, and then uh, in this procedure, you use Schrodinger equation just to find the mixing coefficients, assuming that the configuration state functions have already been determined. In the multi-configuration approach, both, uh, which, which actually is a variational approach, both mixing coefficients and the wave functions are varied. And uh, probably it's fair to say that for general uh, atomic uh, systems, multi-electron atoms and ions, multi-configuration methods provide uh, uh, the best accuracy. There are non-relativistic non Hartree Fock codes, uh, and you can go to this site, nlt.nis.gov/mchf, and you can download a uh, multi-configuration Hartree Fock code developed by Charlotte, uh, by Charlotte uh, uh, Froese Fisher. We also have uh, their uh, uh, multi-configuration Dirac Fock codes, which are fully relativistic. Grasp decay, and then there is another 
code uh, developed by Declaw in France, also multi-configuration Dirac code. And there are uh, different flavors of GRASP. Original GRASP, GRASP 96, right? GRASP 2K, and uh, relative uh, uh, Stefan's code is based on, on, on GRASP. So these uh, multi-configuration type codes are extremely widely used in, uh, 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 in research. Then there are various perturbation theory methods that probably best work when you have just one, two electron outside of closed shells, uh, but uh, they, they can be really very powerful. And recently, there are new methods developed uh, uh, based on B-splines that also take m ideas of multi-configuration, Hartree fork or Dirac fork uh, uh, as, as the basis and then uh, build everything on B-splines. Now, one of the, um, one of the uh, important uh, ideas about uh, atomic structure is idea of how everything scales when you change the ion charge, more or less keeping the same uh, uh, number of electrons. Of course, we know that this is called isoelectronic sequence, when we keep the same number of electrons but simply change the charge of the nucleus. Um, now, the primary characteristic is actually not the ion charge here, but rather um, ion charge plus one, which is normally called spectroscopic charge. And of course, you know notation like, like H1, argon 15, and 15 and 1 are the spectroscopic charges. Charges. So this spectroscopic charge is actually what, what is seen by outermost valence electron. And therefore, at large distances, certainly this electron, what, what it sees nuclear, some electrons here. So altogether, it's more or less like Coulomb field, and or better to say, more or less like uh, hydrogenic ion. And this is exactly where the main part of this scaling comes from. So uh, in principle, you can uh, derive uh, spectroscopic charge scaling for one electron energies in non-relativistic case. And the leading term is E0, uh, zero, where E0 zero is nothing but hydrogenic term 1 over n squared. And here you have z squared. So of course, this is, this is purely hydrogenic uh, uh, ion uh, term. But then you have, of course, the other terms, lower powers of uh, zc that describe different effects. For instance, this term is mainly telling you about the term splitting within your uh, N shell. And of course, relativistic effects slightly modify this depend, but general trend remains valid. That you go to higher ion charges, of course, the C is practically the same. And this term becomes more and more important compared to all other terms, which means that going from low ion charges to high ion charges, your atomic structure becomes more and more hydrogenic. So if you have uh, levels of terms for uh, the same uh, principal quantum number or different quantum numbers that even may overlap, you increase the uncharge and everything starts shrinking into groups of elements that look very much like hydrogenic uh, systems. So uh, from this, it follows that uh, the whole energy structure of an ion has part that is uh, uh, related to primarily electron nucleus interaction with energy splitting small less proportional to the Square. Then we have electron, electron interactions proportional to z that are responsible for terms. And then we have spin orbit splitting that gives levels from terms if we're talking about uh, uh, non-relativistic LS coupling. And uh, um, this is where we start from. So um, how can we easily see that indeed going along isotonic sequence we become more and more hydrogenic. Well, uh, I'll show you in the second lecture uh, the interface to the NIST atomic spectra database. But one of the things that we do have there is this ability to build Grotian di diagrams that simply show you uh, the positions of all 
levels that we have in the database for a particular ion. Uh, the x-axis simply uh, denotes here different uh, configuration or different series of levels in this case. So if we look at singly ionized aluminum, which is magnesium-like because, of course, it has 12 electrons like magnesium, and let's find out where the uh, levels belonging to configurations where both electrons have n equal 3 are. So what we have in the database is, of course, the ground state 3 s squared. Then these two groups of level, there are more than one uh, here, belong to 3 s 3 p. These two are 3 p squared. Then we have 3 s 3 d. Then we have 3 p 3 d. And of course, there must be also 3 d 3 d, but they are sitting above ionization potential. And then actually, for aluminum 2, those levels have not been determined experimentally as of today. So you see that 3, 3 levels are distributed all over uh, uh, the whole range of energies from the ground state all the way to the ionization potential. This uh, purple line shows you the position of the ionization potential for aluminum 2. And these are units of inverse centimeters. Now, if we look at another magnesium-like ion, but with much higher charge, and try to find the same levels, we'll find that they're sitting much, much closer to the ground state uh, uh, with regard to the ionization potential. So now we're looking at 26 times ionized strontium, again, magnesium-like, and these levels are more or less the same, 3 squared, 3 s 3 p 3 p squared, 3 s 3 d 3p, 3d, and even 3d squared. And you see they are all compressed, which means that the energy differences between all these signs, they do increase, but not as fast as ionization potential, which increases as z squared. Now, spin orbit interaction is certainly one of the most interesting things in atomic structure. For hydrogenic ion, uh, the parameter that characterizes it uh, is proportional to the fourth power of the uh, nuclear charge. So it's, it's really a very strong uh, uh, effect. And it's inversely proportional to the third power of uh, the principal quantum number. So it dies out quickly with increase of n. And of course, you see that the L value, uh, uh, it also decreases with, with uh, L for hydrogenic. If you move from hydrogenic uh, ion to uh, general atom, there is no uh, uh, simple formula like this one that is derived from Dirac equation. You can use some semi-theoretical lambda formula where, uh, which looks more or less the same, but there are some differences. Of course, the fine structure constant is, is the same indeed. And here is replaced by effective principal quantum number, which is derived through hydrogenic formula from the energy of this particular state that we're trying to characterize. L is, of course, the same. But then z uh, to the fourth is split into two parts. One part is the uh, spectroscopic charge, or effective charge that the electron sees. And the other is effective nuclear charge, and, uh, which uh, slightly changes depending on whether the orbit of your electron penetrates much or it doesn't. So for instance, for NP orbitals, you can replace uh, uh, Z tilde with uh, uh, I, uh, nuclear charge minus L, N. And then this, is, uh, uh, this spin orbit parameter enters our Hamiltonian right here and can be used to calculate uh, the energy splitting uh, through perturbation theory, for instance. So, there are different types of couplings that you certainly uh, heard about, LS coupling, JJ, some other intermediate. And more or less, the whole story is based between comparison of uh, Coulomb interaction between electrons and spin orbit interaction of electrons uh, uh, for, for particular electrons. So if electron-electron interaction is much stronger than uh, spin orbit, then this is what uh, we have for LS coupling, which is typical for light elements. In that case, uh, uh, you get the total angular momentum just summing up all else of particular electrons. 
the same for the total spin, and your final uh, total or total angular momentum j is simply sum of two vectors and ls. For j, j coupling, the situation is inverse. Spin orbit is much stronger than electron-electron interaction. Therefore, you must start with taking each electron and summing up its L and S value into a J. And you do this for all electrons, of course, not those that are in the closed shell, because in closed shells, everything is zeroed out. You just forget about closed shell for, for your uh, angle momentum consideration. And final J is, of course, the sum of total J. So uh, you're used to LS. A uh, couple of notation like singlet P or triplet D or something. Uh, in JJ, uh, coupling slightly different notations I use. Use those relativistic thing that I showed you before. For instance, 2s to P would be represented as 2s one half to P one half or 2s to P minus for one half. If there were three halves here, then here you would put plus. Uh, if you have more complex configuration like 3d5, you may split this in two, depending on really how the quantum numbers are calculated, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, these are extreme cases when one of the types of interaction is much stronger than the other. But uh, uh, of course, you may meet cases when uh, neither of these is stronger. And this is what is normally referred to as the intermediate coupling. Um, what is the energy structure for different types of coupling? For LS, let's consider, for instance, simplest case of SP configuration. So we know that if it's an LS coupling, then electrostatic is stronger than spin orbit. And naturally, your SP is split by electrostatic into terms. So you have only one possible value of L, which is P. Of course, you add 0 and, and 1, get only 1. And then you have. Singlet and triplet. Triplet lies below than singlet, and this is the Hoon's rule that we will talk about again. And then with spin orbit, you split all these terms into the levels. And of course, if spin orbit interaction is not too strong, these splittings would not be very large compared to the difference uh, in energies of, of, of these two terms. And of course, if, if you put your system in the magnetic field, uh, your j values, which are 0, 1, 2 here, will split into, into simple states. So this is the standard terminologies. J values are levels. These are terms. And these m uh, uh, sublevels are normally called states. Going to JJ coupling, you get the same number of levels. Simply, you get them slightly differently. You have a sp splitting by spin orbit of the p electron into uh, two JJ terms. Again, remember that here one half is related to S, three halves is related to P, and then through electrostatic interaction, these two summed up. So you take J of one electron, one half, J of the other electron, three halves, sum them up, get value of one and two. And the same here, you get value of zero and one. And finally, the states are produced if you put the same uh, system into a magnetic field. Now, looking at this simple structure, you can ask a natural question. Uh, can we find some simple formulas that can describe what happens here? And the answer is yes, for, for simpler system, if you forget about everything else, you can write simple formulas. Uh, there are a few very nice books that describe the details starting from classical Condon and Chantley theory of atomic spectra of 1935. Cowan's book has a lot in it. So basically, uh, the non-central uh, part of the uh, Coulomb potential can generally be represented as sum of uh, two types of contributions. One is related to direct Coulomb interaction, and the other is directed to exchange Coulomb interaction, which certainly is specific for quantum mechanics, not for classical mechanics. Uh, these two uh, parameters, which are called Slater integrals, uh, are introduced through uh, with factors. Excuse me. The, here it should be g, g. So f, f, g. And uh, lowercase f and g are simply numbers that can be derived from 
uh, uh, angular algebra. So if we're looking at situation when we have one s electron and another electron that has uh, orbital angular momentum l, we can write formulas that describe how the levels will be split. So f0 is direct Coulomb uh, uh, Slater integral. gl is just one in this series. This series is not infinite. It, it ends up de depending on quantum numbers. And then you have contribution from the spin orbit. Now let's see what happens if spin orbit becomes zero. That is, we only expect it to have singlet and triple, uh, triplet uh, uh, term, and all levels in the triplet will have the same energy. So if zeta spin orbit parameter goes to zero, this becomes f minus g, this becomes f minus g, and triplet level 3LL, which corresponds to the lower sine becomes, let's see, 0, 0, 0, square root of g squared g, also becomes f0 minus g. So from here, you see that at least these formulas really give us what we uh, expect to have for such simple system. And uh, the last uh, transparency before we end up for uh, uh, break. Um, As we already know, the spin orbit very strongly depends on, on uh, ion charge. So we can expect that if for lower members of isoelectronic sequence with low ion charges, spin orbit is small, and therefore we have a less coupling. For higher members with high ion charges, because of such strong spin orbit, we may expect transition from LS to JJ. And indeed, this is exactly what, what happens. What you see here is the energy structure of the 1s2p configuration in helium-like ion uh, along uh, practically all uh, uh, sequence of nuclear charges from neutral helium to probably ending with tungsten, which is 74. Now, the energies are rescaled. So what you see here, the uh, energy of the highest level, which is singlet P1, uh, for uh, low members of the sequence is one, and it kept one everywhere, and energies of the triplet uh, levels are rescaled, keeping j equals zero at zero all the time. What we see at lower members of the electronic sequence, there is a singlet, there's a triplet, and all triplets sitting together. Basically, this means that this is indeed a less coupling the electrostatic interaction splits terms far, and spin orbit is too small to uh, produce something more than uh, just tiny split in here. Now we go to uh, higher z's, and immediately you see that the whole structure changes. We have two levels here, doublet, two levels here, doublet, and they exactly correspond to what we would expect for uh, JJ coupling uh, pictures as, as we saw previously. So let me stop at this point. We continue in 10 or 20 minutes? I don't remember. 10 minutes. So we'll back at uh, 2.15.